This is the fifth generation Lexus RX. The RX is credited with starting the luxury crossover fad, so you can thank Lexus for the BMW X5. But seriously, what's changed and is the RX a good luxury crossover? Let's find out. The Lexus RX debuted in late 1990s, having started life in Japan as the Toyota Harrier. Lexus needed a model that was neither an off-roader like the LX, nor a sedan like the LS. The RX proved to be a hit and soon other manufacturers began launching their offerings in the segment. In its second generation, the RX got a Toyota-like hybrid powertrain, in this case combined with a more powerful engine. The third generation saw the debut of an all-new all-wheel drive system, which allowed up to 100% of power to be sent to the front wheels, making the car more fuel efficient. In the fourth generation, in addition to the massive radiator grille, we saw optional adaptive suspension and an extended body version with a third row of seats. Two new powertrain versions make their debut in the fifth generation. First is a plug-in hybrid, we've already seen that in the NX, and the second is a hybrid powertrain with a turbocharged engine. Now, the fifth generation RX is virtually the same size as the fourth generation. The only significant difference is the wheelbase, which here is longer by six centimeters, and we have a wider track by one and a half centimeters in the front and by five centimeters in the rear. Lexus already offered a turbocharged engine in the past in the models with the 200T designation. It was probably a test bed as these engines had astronomically bad fuel economy. I remember the NX 200T used around 14 to 15 liters per 100 kilometers on the motorway. You might have just as well shoved a V8 under the bonnet. But Lexus doesn't offer the RX with a V8 or these days not even with a V6. All engines have four cylinders and a displacement of 2.4 or 2.5 liters. The most powerful engine being the one with a minimally smaller displacement, but with a turbo. That's the 500H. In some markets, there's also a 350 without a hybrid with the same 2.4 liter turbocharged motor. In Europe, we get the 350H, which is a regular hybrid with 250 horsepower, the 450H+, Plus, which is a plug-in hybrid with 309 horsepower, and the 500H, which is a regular hybrid with a turbocharged engine and 371 horsepower. Lexus provided me with all three engine variants of the RX to review, and we agreed that uh, I would record a review with the 350H, which is probably the most popular one due to the price. I drove all three cars on identical route, roughly a third in the city, a third on winding country roads and a third on expressways. I also performed my diagonal approach test and I measured the acceleration from 0 to 100 km per hour. And here's what I learned. First was the Lexus RX 450h Plus, which is a plug-in hybrid. Lexus says it'll do 69 km in pure electric mode and this is exactly how far I reached before the petrol engine kicked in. It was a warm but not a very hot day. The car has an 18.1 kWh traction battery, the energy consumption was above 20 kWh per 100 km, so it all adds up. 
In this configuration, the RX 450H Plus weighs about 2.2 tons, but you don't feel it. The car is very comfortable, but it also has a lot of oomph when needed. Switching from the Mazda CX-60, which I was reviewing just before that, I thought the RX is exactly what the CX-60 should have been. Mazda's designers couldn't decide whether they were aiming for comfort or gym by tie, and the CX-60 is neither particularly comfortable nor particularly sporty. The Lexus, on the other hand, is definitely comfortable. Like in the Lexus NX 450H Plus, which I reviewed a year ago, also in the RX 450H Plus, once the energy in the main traction battery is depleted, the car goes into a regular hybrid mode, and then it's less fun because the eCVT is certainly great in terms of efficiency, but not necessarily when it comes to overall driving experience. Next up was the RX 500H. I didn't really know what to expect, so I was pleasantly surprised. Despite the hybrid powertrain with a four-cylinder, but turbocharged, engine, the driving characteristics are similar to a V8. There's a lot of grunt, it sounds good enough, at least from the inside, and you can feel where the money went, as the prices for this version start at €92,500. It certainly helps that instead of an eCVT, the RX 500H has a six-speed automatic. A less pleasant surprise was the handling, because Despite the standard adaptive suspension and the four-wheel steering system, on the same twisty roads the RX 500H handled just like the 450H Plus and then the 350H. Push it too hard and it understeers. So the ride is great, the handling less so. It's not like I expected sporty handling, but uh, the adaptive suspension and four-wheel steering don't seem to do much. And the 500H is by far the most expensive in the RX range. I recorded about 9 liters per 100 kilometers combined, which is 1 liter more than Lexus promises. The onboard computer showed a range of about 500 kilometers. Meanwhile, with a 65 liter fuel tank, the car should travel about 700 kilometers. Perhaps other reviewers focused more on the performance and the trip computer was showing a conservative range. And last but not least, the RX 350H I'm driving today. Having driven the two more powerful versions, I find the 350H somewhat lacking. It's nice that the fuel consumption is only 6 liters per 100 kilometers, and that's better than what the manufacturer claims, but I have to suffer because of the regular hybrid powertrain, so there's lots of noise which isn't correlated with the speed. Other than that, driving characteristics are very similar, if not identical, to the other two versions. Let's jump to my diagonal approach test. I stop halfway, leaving two wheels on the diagonal with limited grip, and then I try to get going again. All three cars behaved in the same way. In normal mode, they started without any problem. In off-road mode, because they all have an off-road mode as well, the traction control allows a little more slip, which can come in handy when you need to gain some momentum to get out of deeper snow, within reason and as long as you have some traction, of course. The most interesting attempts are with the traction control system off, because then you can see there is no connection between the front and rear axle. The front axle is powered by an internal combustion engine and the rear axle is powered by an electric motor. Simply put, all the power escapes through the wheels which have no traction and the car begins to roll back. Now, the RX is not an off-road car, so I don't expect advanced all-wheel drive. I'm just showing you this as an interesting case. And now acceleration. All three powertrain variants achieve more or less what the manufacturer claims, with the sport mode not always being faster than the normal mode. The RX 450H Plus achieved 6.4 seconds instead of promised 6.5 seconds. The RX 500H achieved 6 seconds instead of the promised 6.2 seconds. The RX 350H achieved promised 7.9 seconds, but only in normal mode, as it was marginally slower in sport mode. Which of these powertrains would I choose then? Mm, I'm tempted with the 500H, but this engine version only comes in the F Sport trim, 
which means black upholstery and I prefer lighter interiors. A matter of taste, I know. By the way, I found the F-Sport seats were the most comfortable, so it's worth test driving the F-Sport versus other variants. You know, get a feel for it. If I can't have the 500H because I don't like the interior, 450H Plus is a reasonable choice. I have a place to charge it and the 69 kilometers range is enough for me for 80% of the time I use the car. So I don't have to listen to the 350H hybrid sound. Unfortunately, the pleasure of not listening to the hybrid costs more than six grand extra. Too many ads, man? Well, I'm sorry, but do you work for free? This is how I make a living, but you can become a channel member and get to watch my reviews ad-free, and there's early access as well. So, thanks to the current members, and you can become one of them. Click join. Unless you insist on the Mark Levison audio system, which is only available on the two highest trim levels, you want to go with the middle trim. And that's only because of the tech package for 2,250 euro, which includes features like the head-up display, a 360 camera, and nano EX filter, among others. Uh, there are a few more things in the tech pack, but you can live without them. However, for an 80 grand car, you expect a 360 camera, right? Now, the problem with the head-up display is that it comes with touch-sensitive buttons on the steering wheel, not these ones, fortunately, uh, and resulting strange operation of cruise control and multimedia. I talked about it in my Lexus NX review last year. Something flashes up on the head-up display and then disappears. In addition, the buttons on either side of the steering wheel have then dual functions. <laughs> so you're staring at the head-up display, hoping that you're adjusting the speed for your cruise control, but in fact you switched from Radio Classic and tuned into reggae rhythms, and you have no idea what a lion is doing in Jerusalem. Other than that, the cockpit is simple and legible. There are physical buttons and knobs for basic functions. The only thing missing is a driving mode switch, which was in the NX. Driving modes and other more advanced functions are controlled from the infotainment system. It can be paired with the Lexus Link app, so your favorite settings will be assigned to your driver profile and recognized when you get in the car with your phone. Unfortunately, settings for the ISA or the Intelligent Speed Assistance cannot be assigned to the driver profile. Now, this is an EU requirement for all cars homologated from July 2022 and ultimately for all new cars sold in Europe from July 2024. The ISA emits a visual and audible warning every time you cross the speed limit and it can be disabled but it has to be disabled every time you turn the car on. Data from ESA regarding how drivers interact with the system and how fast they are actually driving is collected and will be studied by the EU researchers. Something tells me workshops that decode various car systems will have their hands full. I consider myself a relatively law-abiding driver and ESA pisses me off immensely. While in the NX I complained the cockpit was rather cramped, I find the RX sitting situation much more comfortable, there is more room to put stuff, there are large door pockets, ample storage under the armrest, and a medium-sized glove box. There are also good cup holders and another storage compartment in front with an induction charger and two of the four USB outlets. There are three USB-C and one USB-A port in the front. The latter is used for phone data transfer when you want to use Android Auto. Apple CarPlay is wireless. Doors cover the sills. There are large door pockets, a storage compartment and cup holders in the armrest.
a third zone climate control, and two more USB-C ports. In the back there is plenty of legroom and headroom. The backrests have an adjustable tilt angle. On higher trim, the backrest angle and folding of the backrests can be controlled electrically. The rear backrest splits 40-20-40, something that was missing from the smaller NX. Regardless of the powertrain version, the boot volume in the five-seat configuration is the same, but it is unclear what it is. Different sources provide different values. So, for example, Lexus in Poland simply states 612 liters. Ta-da! But the Germans say 612 VDA to the roof and 461 VDA under the cargo cover. The Americans say the boot volume is just 840 liters, which I assume is to the roof because in the States nobody knows what the cargo cover is for. Now, according to my calculations, the boot volume is about 500 liters. The 461 liters VDA measurement is probably with the backrest tilted all the way backwards, and it does not take into account the underfloor storage. Now, the Germans also quote 1678 liters with the second row folded, and the Americans say it's 1308 liters. There are two shopping bag hooks, a 12 volt outlet, and buttons to fold the second row backrests. On higher trims, you can also put the backrest back up automatically. Unfortunately, there is no space under the floor to store the cargo cover, but the storage compartment is sufficient for a charging cable on the PHEV. Prices for the Lexus RX start at €68,650 for the base level 350H. This is a mid-trim for about €77,000. From my point of view, you need at least €83,000-£85,000 for an RX. Well, I'm interested only in the PHEV because the RX 500H is too expensive and doesn't handle like one would expect from a car with adaptive suspension and four-wheel steering. If you're looking for a comfortable SUV of this size, which will not overwhelm you with tech, the RX should be on your radar. And how do you like the Lexus RX? Maybe you own one of the previous generations. How is it to live with? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.